Envelope podcast. We have a very special podcast today with a very special guest called Simon Reynolds. Welcome, Simon. Thank you for joining <laughs> us. Thank you for having me. So 25 years in human performance. Um, and in that time, you've worked with over 40 drivers from Carter to F1, including nine F1 drivers uh, at various races and events, and also prepared two people to win Formula 2 championships. So pretty successful run in motorsport, I would say. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, to be honest, I mean, it's, it's been a privilege to have been given the opportunity to uh, to work in the sport for 14 years or uh, well, 15 years now uh, and and sort of 25 years overall supporting young athletes and normal population, things like that. Yeah. So where did where did it start? So obviously before you've had a long career in, in motorsport, um, but where tell us a bit about your background and kind of where it all began. <laughs> okay well I won't bore you too long but um, <laughs> um, so I was eight years old and uh, yeah so I'm not going to track right back from eight years old but, yeah, I, uh, I, I was eight years old and I attended a most sport exhibition in London and, and strangely I can remember it really vividly because my best friend's father was really super into most sport and my, my dad was as well uh, but more so with my friend's father who had F1 memorabilia and models everywhere around the house. Mm. Um, and I've got these, these images right now of what that looked like. And so I guess that really that really fueled it. And then my father was also uh, coached and tested at Goodwood um, in an F3 car um, back in sort of the 80s. And he did some amateur level racing following that. Um, so he did some sort of amateur based events uh, for a short period of time and that really really ignited my interest in Formula One and I, I, I watched most races uh, from the 80s onwards and was always sitting down at weekends with my father and uh, all my friends father watching watching F1 uh, with a cup of tea <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah that's that's where it really really started I guess um, from from that early age uh, oh, in terms of in terms of most sport yeah and was that always your aim then so you obviously became a PT originally and um, was that your aim right I'm going to go down this this road or or was it not necessarily like that and I mean was the, being a PT even on the cards to start with yeah I mean being a PT was very different back then um sort of in the in the late 90s um when I started my my career I I just finished my A-levels and I was going to go to university and study graphic design uh, my father felt uh, fell seriously ill and it sort of changed things at that point mm. and I, I, I kind of established a gym set up at school and I, I used to go to lunch, uh, lunch times and start training oh, okay. and, and as, as my friend saw me from going from a nine, nine stone skinny uh, individual to a 12 stone larger person um, <laughs> they, they became very fascinated and wanted to join in so I had I almost established my own gym at, uh, at school <laughs> and that, that that really ignited my interest and and back then you, you couldn't do there were, there were there weren't really sort of university courses in health and fitness it was really kind of just sports science uh the, the PE teacher route um and there wasn't really those sort of courses so I did some vocational courses from there and and then sort of worked on on sort of further education later on but um but but yeah, back then it was it was all about fitness and all about sort of training and uh, enjoying myself and uh, and things like that. So that's kind of where it where it really spurned from um, in terms of the career itself. Yeah. And then I started in a health club. Yeah, I worked for a, pres a prestigious health club. Uh, they had a small number of uh, of sort of facilities around the UK, and I managed the fitness facility and started to then work with all sorts of different demographic. And then I became really interested in working with younger population. I started to head up a young kind of uh, fitness class or whatever it was at that time, if I can recall it. <laughs> and uh, I really enjoyed it. And I love working with the young people. And from there, I then established my own business, uh, personal training business, which was very successful. Had over 80 clients um, over three and a half years wow. and uh, really worked particularly hard uh, on that. Yeah. And that sort of then led me on to obviously the role at McLaren. Mm. Yeah. So you were driving performance manager at McLaren for 14 years. Is that right? I was. I was yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So how, I, how did you end up at McLaren then? 
Well, my mum's friend saw an advert in the paper for a part-time, uh, two part-time positions at McLaren. And I, my eyes lit up. Mm. So I thought I'd, I put, I, I didn't think I'd even get the interview to be honest. I, I, I put, I, I sort of sent my CV in and uh, and so forth, and I got the interview. And I sat down with Dr. Aki Hintzer, the famous uh, chief medical officer at the time, and uh, the two F1 trainers, um, and also Adam, who was Lewis's physio. And I was so nervous, <laughs> fish out of water. I think the phrase is. <laughs> And oh, nice. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I know I, I wasn't expecting to sit down with the F1 coaches to be honest. Yeah. I was like, extremely nervous about that. Uh, so I got through the interview, really enjoyed it. I love the people. Um, I mean, Dr. Aki Hintzer, I mean, he just talks for a, a few minutes and you're in awe um, yeah. of him. Did you and know I, of him before? No, no, not at all. I did my research. I've always researched everything that I do. So I kind of researched about McLaren and the people who I was going to meet. And I think that made me more nervous. I wish I hadn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so I, a week went by, I thought I hadn't got it. And then Adam called me and said, you've got the position and we'd like to offer you both positions into one role wow. and, and help me uh, manage and set up the fitness and wellbeing center at McLaren. So Adam and I effectively uh, established it, the, the center there. And we were then given the, the responsibility and the role to then uh, create the first race team human performance program. Wow. So I was in charge of the fitness um, side of that or the human performance side of that. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time really that the pit crew had actually had sort of that human performance element, which Aki Hintzer speared um, uh, was, was the driving force behind that. Yeah. And that was really exciting. And then from there, it led on to me working with uh, drivers. Yeah. Wow. So they gave you quite a lot of freedom then yeah. to kind of, you know, design what you believe would be the right thing. And, you know, which is amazing at that level to, to get that opportunity and do it how you want to do it, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously, I, I, I was under the strict guidance of Aki and his specialists and yeah. Adam, Adam Costanzo, uh, was my manager and he was incredible um, physio and and obviously working closely with Lewis at that time in Formula 2 to prepare him um, going into Formula 1 and I was very fortunate and lucky enough to have all of those people around me at that time to advise me and you know give me real insight into what was required and understand that sort of methodology and the processes that you have to go through mm. uh, but in terms of establishing that facility and and how, how it operated, then it was a case of uh, Adam and I sort of knuckling down and getting our heads together and working out the best strategy for that effectively. Yeah. So what was it like working for McLaren then? Because obviously they're, they're one of the biggest automotive brands in the world, aren't they? You know, one of the biggest racing teams in the world and all the rest of it. You know, a big hugely machine. successful yeah. as well, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the only words I can describe it to this day is incredible, um, exhilarating, privileged and enamored it's sort of you know i i was always in awe of the building and the people who worked within the building mm -hmm. so i remember the first day i walked down the corridors and it was like a james bond movie set and you go in these lifts that are really slow in terms of opening um and then it, i think i think everything purposely done that way so when you it opens up you see this incredible lake in front of you yeah. and all of these cars and history there and it's strange. You can almost you can almost uh, taste it and feel the the energy within the building. And I again, I was in awe of the people who work there because every person was effectively the best person in their field. Yeah. And McLaren's always been known as hiring the best people, and mm -hmm. I guess that's why I felt so proud to have worked there really and yeah. to be given given the opportunities that I did. And how, how long did it take to adjust? Because obviously going from what you were doing to then thrown into this world of very high level motorsport, flying around the world, you know, working with drivers that again, you know, some of the best in the world, you know, how, how long did it take to adjust to that? Because I can imagine it's a bit like, I can't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> I never did. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, 
without sounding cliche, I, I, I never did really. I, I was always in awe of it. I was, yeah. I was always, um, I always kept my head down, worked as hard as I could, tried to prove myself as best I could in, 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 in the sort of responsibilities I was given. Mm. And, and that led me on to working with, you know, getting more and more responsibilities. Mm. So hard, hard work, yeah. uh, long hours, and and enjoying the process and just being just feeling privileged to be there and yeah. and and lucky to be there and you know I never I never took it for granted uh, I was always pinching myself every time I went into the building just just because it was it's just such an incredible place to to work really absolutely and you work with some real elite drivers so people like uh, Magnuson and Van Dorn and uh, Nick DeVries people like that so do any of them stand out <laughs> I'm not going to name names who stand out. <laughs> Yeah, that could be good or bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you probably have to be a bit yeah, PC with this one. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it was just incredible to be given the opportunities to work with the, the drivers that I did. I, I, as I said, I don't want to name names, but but I will mention a few drivers. Obviously, the three drivers that I supported over a long period of time was Kevin Magnussen from the age of 16 into Formula One. So it's five years. Uh, Stoffel van Dorn was four and a half years uh, from his from his Formula Renault to Formula One. Mm -hmm. uh, and Nick de Vries was my longest serving driver, supporting him for 11 years uh, from the age of 14. Uh, and it was still extremely close to this day. Um, Heike Kovalainen, I was his trainer in 2008, which, uh, I mean, the fish out of water thing was definitely, <laughs> definitely a, a good description there. Um, winning the Hungarian Grand Prix was a standout moment for sure. That was his first F1 race win. Yeah. And preparing him for that was was really exciting, and what an incredible opportunity that was. Mm. Uh, Formula One for me was something that that I loved to kind of do over the years, stepping in and out. And I preferred working with the young drivers and developing them. Mm. So getting the opportunity to effectively manage the human performance program element of the McLaren Young Drive program yeah. uh, was 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 in you know incredible that's the only word i, I keep saying incredible but it, it was incredible really and to begin the opportunity to work with drivers like ben barnico oliver Rowland, alex alban uh, will stevens pedro de la rosa lando norris gary paffett oliver <laughs> Turner, jack harvey tom blomquist um, <laughs> just a few it must be hard though in some respects because they they must all be quite different people, I suppose, and different personalities. And you've got to, you know, build that relationship with them. Um, you know, so it's not just about the fitness, is it? It's also the personal side. So do you spend a, a lot of time with each individual driver to build up that, that relationship? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, everything is about relationships and communication. So the, the fitness side of it and the nutrition side of it and the recovery, everything like that's the easy bit, really. Uh, that's the bit you know inside out. But it's actually applying that to the individual that's the, that's the challenge. Mm. And I sort of built up over that period a sort of methodology and a process of, of establishing relationships. And, it, and, 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 and as you say, working with the individual. And they're all different personality types. But the one thing they have in common is all of them were incredible drivers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and... And their, their sort of way of driving and their way that they approach things and the way they prepare was different. Mm -hmm. And you have to find out what works for that individual. There's no point being a trainer and sticking with textbook kind yeah. of protocols that you learn in university or you learn in doing courses or whatever you do. They, they help give you a base of knowledge, but there's nothing like actually being in the field and getting the experience of working with lots of different personalities uh, lots of different sort of likes and dislikes uh, yeah. and and they have their own methodologies and, and processes that work for them and they they built up their own experience over time yeah. to understand that and you have to learn that as well mm -hmm. so being really close with them especially uh with with those three drivers that i work with particularly closely mm -hmm. um and there's 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 multiple standout moments uh, within that period, like Kevin Wid winning the World Series championship, mm -hmm. Stoffel winning Formula Two, uh, Stoffel replacing Fernando uh, after testing uh, in Super Formula, flying over. I flew out with him, and he finished P10 in the race. Yeah. And 
preparing him physically for that and he, for him to come out of the car looking fresh and the, the press commenting on how fresh he looked after he finished was, I was like, yes. <laughs> um, and then Nick winning Formula 2 uh, recently, obviously a couple of years ago, was just, yeah, was yeah. amazing. So over a, a weekend and at that highest level, because I, I imagine a lot of the work is beforehand, but over the weekend, what is your job? Is there still a lot of fitness going on behind the, the background or at that point, is it more just kind of managing them in general? So I, I'm an accredited sports therapist. So uh, you have two hats effectively, as I say. So you have your therapy hat that you put on when you go to a race. Mm -hmm. And then you, away from the race, the preparation side is the human performance physical aspect. So you put your, put your S&C coach's hat on. Yeah. Uh, so you don't really do a lot of training you know, at races. You, you may do a little bit, maybe just as a preparation, but you're not looking to de develop them at that point. You're looking to peak their performance. Um, and it's all about optimizing recovery effectively. And part of that is doing therapy. So I, I get stuck in there and I have a lot of experience working on lots of drivers' bodies in terms of working out what areas specifically get tight mm -hmm. and, and then unwinding the sort of postural discrepancies and biomechanical issues that can develop by being in the car. Yeah. So it's the same as an office worker. You know, if I, if I turn my chair and I sit, sit like this, yeah. As soon as I slouch, my sternum um, becomes depressed yeah. and then locks down so the diaphragm doesn't move effectively. Um, and my, my head then moves forward and your head weighs 8% of your body weight and puts a lot of strain on the neck. And also then I have a curved upper spine, the thoracic spine, which then internally rotates your shoulders. So you lose the ability to extend your spine if you're in that position for long, longer periods. Okay. So with drivers, you have to obviously work on those uh, on those areas. Uh, and when they're young, uh, they're obviously made from rubber and magic. So it doesn't take too long to just unwind that. And as they get older, yeah. then all of those connective tissues um, become less pliable. Okay. And you've then got to really manage that properly away from the track. Yeah. in your kind of what we call prehabilitation mm -hmm. exercise routines mm -hmm. where you're working on lots of exercises to create uh, lots of extension because they're in lots of flexion <laughs> does that make sense yeah yeah, yeah. because when they're um, a lot of people don't realize but like in the form one car they're pretty much lying down aren't they and and like you say you're fairly sort of rounded because you're holding the steering wheel in this position and it's so different to what people assume because it's a very different position to a road car isn't it and they have a huge amount of g's and load on their on their heads don't they they're going round. so i can imagine that area all being a major focus like you said yeah yeah exactly, exactly. as you know that, that they're in this sort of reclined position i can only describe it as sitting in a bath uh, mm. with your feet on the taps and being heavily strapped in so you can't actually move mm. uh, and, and that's that's for good reason for safety as well as uh, the fact that uh, you want to be immersed into the feeling of the car we call that kinesthetic feedback where you feel through your nervous system and, and cues that you pick up uh, from vibration and oscillations and movements of the car. Mm -hmm. So going off the curbs um, is a pretty obvious one. You can feel the car moving. Mm -hmm. um, but when you become one with the car, sounds a bit cheesy, but when you become one with, with the car, man and machine are together, mm -hmm. uh, that's when you're fully immersed into this uh, world of racing and the world of, of driving effectively as, as you as your driver coaches you can teach that skill but that feeling of of being one is yeah. is so important as a driver um, but also understanding that as a performance coach as well is super important so having the experience of working with multiple drivers to understand what it's like to be immersed in that position although yeah. you never have that opportunity the closest i ever got was to uh to go onto the simulators which okay. were incredible yeah. um, and and that's pretty close but yeah. Uh, and I was I was rubbish, but um, <laughs> hey, simulators are different, though. To be fair, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, the, the simulators yeah. are incredible. I mean, the, I mean, the I mean, the McLaren simulators, for example, with the motion platforms yeah. uh, and things like that that other other Formula One teams use and are, are just unbelievable. You know, yeah. another another world of of simulation. But uh, but yeah, no. So going back to Formula One 
they are under he heavy amounts of strain mm -hmm. effectively through their whole body. So the physiological loading on their body is extremely high. And as you said, from G-force, mm -hmm. uh, they've got to contend with longitudinal and horizontal G-forces. Um, so around four and a half to five G it, uh, laterally in cornering. Yeah. Uh, maxim maximally around sort of 5G or so, uh, maybe slightly more, and then 6G uh, plus thereabouts uh, it, uh, under braking. Yeah, yeah. So that's the equivalent loads of a sort of 10 to a 12 year old child, just to give you an idea, or a lot of bags of sugar. Um, yeah, if you, yeah. uh, 40 bags of sugar, imagine that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> compressing onto your, onto your head. Uh, which weighs uh, around five kilos and add one and a half kilos of helmet weight, make six and a half. Yeah. Uh, and then you multiply that by the G forces and you can get an understanding then of how much force is going through their neck. Oh, absolutely. You can see it. Like uh, what amazes me when they hit the brakes, you can physically see how much they shrink in, in the cockpit. Um, you know, and okay, when the drivers, we appreciate that, that, that feel, but for anybody who hasn't actually been in, that environment, you can actually see it. You can actually see what's going on hmm. um, and how much they compress just under braking. And most people probably wouldn't imagine that the G's would be that great under braking. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's, it, I can imagine it. Uh, well, a lot of drivers like Jensen Button and things who've moved on do triathlons and all sorts of stuff. And they're just super, super fit in every way, aren't they? You know, um, got a lot of stamina as well as having to to be quick with what they do um yeah it's it's very impressive uh, impressive um what you're doing and what you've achieved but moving forward then to, to now then so you left mclaren and you've got your own business yeah absolutely yeah so I left mclaren uh december 2019 mm -hmm. uh established my business two weeks prior to lockdown yeah uh, which is great timing on my part. <laughs> um <laughs> And uh, yes, I, I established Formus Perform mm -hmm. um, and, and developed the strategies over the years uh, that went towards building up to that, that sort of um, opportunity. Mm. So it's like the next chapter, effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So you've got all these philosophies that you obviously you, you've developed over your time at McLaren, which I guess make what you're doing pretty unique. You've got a proof that they work. Um, would you say that's fair then, that, that, that it's all fairly unique to Formula to perform what you're doing? Um, I, in some ways, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm. I, I don't think you can ever say that you're doing something, you know, revolutionary that nobody's ever done before. But I think it's using the experience. Uh, I always say experience is gold. Yeah. Uh, you, you you can't buy experience. Um, you have to go through a long, many years of of learning through failure. Yeah. So I certainly did that. So <laughs> multiple times I think failing, everybody does uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah multiple times of failing uh, and, and, and successes. So you learn from that and you end up establishing something that you believe works. Yeah. Um, 16 championships uh, sort of uh, over that period was enough to then learn about what, what works for individuals and working with multiple different individuals helps as well to, because there are similarities with drivers in terms of their personalities, uh, but obviously a lot of differences. And when you work with similar personalities, you can then understand what works for them mm -hmm. and then what might work different for a different type of personality. As an example, if you've got somebody very laid back, um, very, very kind of calm sort of individual, sometimes they would prefer a different way of preparing and warming up for a race than somebody who's quite hyper and quite energetic. Um, so sometimes you have to develop different strategies of actually preparing drivers um, both from a sort of mindset perspective, um, but yeah. also phys physically. Yeah, because I, I actually saw um, Leclerc um, was kicking a football round just before getting in the car with his trainer. But um, apparently, I don't know if this is true, but Kimi Raikkonen goes for a sleep before getting in the car. <laughs> I don't know how true that is, but like obviously massively different approach to you that know would, just before fit, going, yeah. <laughs> going out in the car. So yeah, I can absolutely see that for sure. So all these, all this knowledge and experience uh, that you've got, which is incredible, you're now bringing that to a kind of wider audience, I guess. Then really, and you've got a number of different programs. So, what what are you what what are you offering to people then now in terms of your different programs? So, so I, I offer at the moment three different sort of packages. Um, uh, one of them is known as the transition driver 
Um, one's the developing driver, and then that's called the other one, the complete driver package. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm really keen to work with drivers um, in karting that are looking to transition into a uh, single seater uh, or Janetta or sort of car, you know, moving onto the cars effectively and, and developing sort of methodologies and systems which help them in that transition process. So as, you, as you're very aware, karting is, is quite dynamic and, and, and quite involved um, in the actual machine. And when you transition to single seaters, uh, it's quite a different type of driving style and a different experience. Mm -hmm. And sometimes drivers find it difficult to go through that transition process, uh, both from a mindset and physical perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's important that they are given the right kind of tools and education and support to go through that process effectively. So you can work with the engineers, the driver coaches, uh, to get in a good understanding of how they are developing and, and going through that process. So I, I always monitor the drivers very, very closely and, and learning effectively how they tick. Um, yeah. So as I said, what works for one body and mind what may not work for another. So drivers under the age of 21, 18 to 21 or so, I monitor their maturation quite closely. Um, so doing measurements on a, a regular basis yeah. to understand their growth stages mm -hmm. and when they go through that what we call the peak height velocity stage uh, normally it's around sort of that 14 15 year old um, stage uh, for males and then slightly younger for females so it's really important that you capture those growth stages so you can alter alter their kind of training um, but also they're going to go through different uh, psychological changes and stages as well so you have to be aware of that and the body's changing so you can have a driver um, who's very solid has good neural control uh, good spatial awareness um, everything's great stable and then all of a sudden they go through a growth stage they get longer limbs yeah and all of a sudden they're they're, they're less stable and a bit more floppy <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because if you think drivers are starting younger and younger, so yeah. you know, there's more, and they're going into cars younger as well, aren't yeah, they? they? That's are, the yeah. thing, yeah. you know. Um, a lot of them now, you gosh, they're 15, aren't they? And yeah. they're thrown into cars. So, so yeah, so that must be quite hard to constantly monitor and, and manage that, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's um it, it's not hard if you monitor it carefully. Yeah. If you don't monitor it, then yes, it's hard because then you don't know at what stage they're going through this period. And you can just see, you can observe changes happening, but you're not sure why. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so important that coaches monitor that process carefully and, and actually uh, monitor their sort of motor skills and their neural development and their mobility and, and building on their spatial awareness and, and awarenesses of, of, of and controlling their bodies in space. Mm -hmm. and, educating them on their technical competence in terms of exercise techniques and things like that. So I always start with very young drivers working on simple little uh, important movements like hinging from the hip. Okay. So many drivers, because of being in driver position, can't hinge from their hip particularly well, and they, they hinge from their back. Right. So it's super important they learn that hinging process. So when you take them on to learning how to squat, Mm. Uh, or how to perform a lunge type pattern or what we call a unilateral exercise so one-sided yeah. uh, that they can perform it with competence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's really really important so and that may change over time as they, as they grow so it's really important to as i said to capture that yeah. uh, so the transition driver does that so offering it to drivers um, and giving them a bespoke pathway effectively yeah. It really shows, though, doesn't it, the difference between nothing against a regular PT, but for a driver, you know, to be with somebody who has your kind of experience mm -hmm. to somebody who goes to the gym and has a, a personal trainer who, who might be, you know, very good yeah, at what they yeah, do, yeah. but not specialised in those areas. You know exactly what a racing driver needs and the loads that are under they're under, whereas I guess a, a, a general PT um, wouldn't necessarily understand exactly those details as such yeah i mean i don't i don't want to um be dismissive about any person in their role um because everyone has their own sort of uh key 
attributes that allow them to be successful in whatever they're doing. Uh, however, yes, I mean, as I said before, experience is gold and going through the experiences of failing a lot and and then and having successes, you, you learn what works ultimately and you learn about the sport. Yeah. Uh, so some, I, 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 was, I was a PT once um, with very limited experience and I can put, I can remember that very clearly, uh, yeah. but I took the opportunity to learn from uh, experienced people so I could then elevate myself to a much higher level and and that's you know hopefully now I can be at an op you know give give drivers what they need um, yeah. because I've had all those experiences yeah. yeah and you'll work with drivers of different ages it's not just people coming out of car thing it could be anybody any stage in their career presumably you can you can you don't need to have started with them from scratch you can pick up from where they are yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I work with um, any any ages currently. Mm. So I've I've got a driver who's um, just turning thirty, mm -hmm. uh, and then I've got a driver, an old older driver, sort of you know in their forties, fifties, mm -hmm. and then I've got young drivers uh, from the age of sort of twelve, thirteen. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's working with the individual. Yeah, is extremely important, and then building a comprehensive package which quantifies um, and qualifies where they're at their, their sort of athletic base is by assessing them effectively so it's really about assessing the individual working out where they are right now a snapshot in time mm -hmm. and then monitoring them closely over a period of time building a program which works for them yeah. and that's really what i'm what i'm all about and what's what forms forms about effectively and there's a form to perform app i believe what can you tell us about that Yes, yeah. I mean, it's an app in in its sort of um, infancy, mm -hmm. and I currently use it to monitor drivers' daily well-being. Mm -hmm. So it's important to capture subjective data as well as objective data. Mm -hmm. So you can use heart rate monitors, for example, to capture certain uh, objective data, like heart rate, for example, is an obvious yeah. one. Uh, you can also monitor sleep as well. So uh, obviously monitoring recovery, uh, and then you can also use um, questionnaires. So I use the app for that purpose, uh, also in development stage to actually use it for exercise. So it will have a training suite on there so you can deliver your programs through the app and the driver, wherever they are in the world, they're in a hotel, they can pick up the phone and their programs on the phone effectively. Right, yeah, so really useful because like you say as well, many drivers, especially going up the ranks, they're traveling, aren't they? They're mm. all over the place as well. So you can't always, I guess, be be there with them um, so that makes it hopefully so much easier when you've got a group of drivers that you're trying to look after yeah i i mean i've worked remotely for with drivers for 10 years hmm. so i developed remote ways of working which are quite new to coaches now but i've been doing that for a long long time and developed strategies of working that way i currently support most of my drivers remotely mm -hmm. and i work you know like whatsapp or a zoom call training them uh, their sort of private school or a uh, home or yeah. uh, you know in a hotel room wherever it might be but it's extremely effective and you can actually link the phone to a smart tv and you get a much better visual uh, of of sort of the coaching from my perspective and also from their perspective yeah. uh, providing them with the right training equipment they need um, using bands and body weight um, and other accessories you know and obviously their their neck harnesses etc mm -hmm. and you can actually take them through a really good uh, program mm -hmm. just utilizing basic equipment if you know what you're doing you know how to manage the exercise program mm -hmm. then you can build a really effective uh, routine for them uh, remotely anywhere in the world so i've got drivers in holland japan <laughs> yeah, amazing, <laughs> um, which, isn't it? which which I've got before and after pictures, taking screenshots of how they were five months ago to now, and there's extreme, extremely um, interesting changes uh, that, that occur over that time. And you can capture that all on your phone. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Unless traveling around, which is great. <laughs> well, I guess yeah. it depends where yeah. you're traveling to, I suppose. But <laughs> <you know>. Absolutely. <laughs> so where do you see that, what, what's your aim now with the business, obviously? unfortunate timing when you started it but obviously you've built it very quickly um so what's your aims going forward so i think build relationships mm -hmm. uh, continue to build partnerships mm -hmm. uh, which is really important um and working with like-minded people is extremely important and uh, building a reputation and a brand as well 
for, for, for working with good people and, and, and sort of having good experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and yeah, really, really, really kind of harnessing those methodologies and the ethos and driving that forward, mm -hmm. hopefully opening my own facility at some point. Yeah. So I've been talking with a, another driver coach, um, a performance coach like myself, um, who I've worked with for 20, over 20 years. Right. And there might be a possibility of looking at a facility in the future. So that'd be right. something that would be really yeah. exciting. Uh, and then continue uh, to de develop young drivers and help them deliver their best on track effectively. Excellent. Good stuff. Have you got any further questions? No, I don't think so. No, that's great. Really yeah. interesting, Simon. Brilliant. Thank you so much for coming on the show and giving us um, you know, some detail of really what a, a racing driver goes through because I think a lot of people and you know can be forgiven for, for not understanding really how physical it is to be a racing driver. Very easy to think they're just sat in the seat. Yeah. Um, but you oh, explaining okay. the, the yeah. loads and what's going on and, and really how detailed the preparation is, is absolutely fascinating. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, really thank, appreciate thank you, it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and honestly, hopefully we'll speak again soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.